Hello everyone, welcome to Chicano Studies 102. This is the first of several lectures uh, that I'll be doing with, in uh, conjunction with my colleague Alex Gomez. I hope you enjoy them. Welcome back. Let's discuss the Mexican-American conflict. Historians have long compared and contrast what happens between the United States of America and Mexico in the early stages of the nation-building process. How does one country become a superpower and the other one still struggles with its democracy today. Let's recap the years before the Mexican-American War. In 1821, Mexico becomes independent after 300 years of colonial rule. But the Mexican Republic was facing economic hardship, political disarray, and social fragmentation. It did have some assets, for example, an enormous amount of land they had inherited from the colonial Spanish monarchy. But Mexico was highly centralized. Most of its population, political and economic centers, were in what today is Mexico City. This left the northern territories fragile, unpopulated, and unprotected. And let's not forget, the United States was moving westward, fueled by the ideology of Manifest Destiny, and perceived the land of the Mexican territories of the north to eventually be part of America's future, from San Francisco to the Texas border. Mexico responds to the threats in the Northern Territories by engaging in an aggressive immigration policy. The 1824 Constitution Law attempted to invite immigrants from China and the United States into Mexico's far north in order to, one, populate, two, develop commerce, and three, incorporate these territories. So how was this supposed to work? Well, the Mexican Republic was offering immigrants, in particular from the U.S. into Texas, seven years taxation uh, uh, breaks, uh, four cents an acre, uh, and certain other guarantees in exchange for uh, the immigrants from the United States to follow the rules. Amongst those rules, one was to become a Mexican citizen and two, to become Catholics. Now. Unfortunately, now this was going to work out, and in fact, it would backfire for the Mexican Republic to the degree that instead of being able to incorporate the land they were seeking to incorporate, they would lose the land eventually to the United States. Part of the problem had to do with cultural collision, as we see in our uh, literature by Raimundo Paredes in The Origins of Anti-Mexican Sentiment. Uh, we noticed that the cultural collision has a lot to do with the uh, anti-Catholic sentiment that was pronounced in the United States and it grew as Americans moved westward, as well as, of course, uh, racism. Uh, quite simply put, uh, many of the immigrants that came into Mexico's Northern Territories came from the American South and they brought with them their slaves, the causing, of course, racial tension in the Mexican Republic. So the 1824 law eventually would become a catalyst for the Mexican-American War instead of a uh, a policy that would secure Mexico's northern territories. So let's examine what goes so wrong with the 1824 colonization law. As we know, there was cultural collision that came from the colonial rivalry between Spain and uh, England and between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. But now in the case of Mexico and the frontier with the United States, uh, there are other challenges that involve economic and political interest. By 1829, there was already a 10 to 1 ratio of American immigrants to every one Mexican national. And those American immigrants began to segregate the Mexican population, even though it was still the country of Mexico. Naturally, this caused uh, fear, anger, and frustration amongst the Mexican community. And the Mexican Republic responded with a series of laws. In 1829, for example, they passed a law, the law of September 15, 1829, which abolished slavery in Mexican territories. Uh, let's look into the 1829 law. Again, it's September 15, 1829 law. This law will abolish slavery in all of Mexico's territories. But it was particularly focused uh, or, or geared towards the American uh, colonist immigrant coming into Mexican territory. The law was trying to discourage any further immigration or to encourage the Americans who came in with slaves to go back to their country of origin. Uh, now, uh, of interest, if we look at the work of Richard Rodriguez del Castillo, uh, we find out that the American colonists in Mexico's territories, in Texas in particular, uh, what they did is um, they, they freed their slaves 
but then they signed them on to lifelong contracts. This was a way to circumvent the law, again, that abolished slavery in, Me in Mexico. Yet another law that is passed in 1830, a, a harsh law, was the law of April 6, 1830. Now you might find this law very interesting because in this law, Mexico basically abolishes immigration from the United States. It makes it illegal uh, for Americans to enter Mexican territory. Uh, and uh, I, I recall uh, that there is a, a reading that say, states, no matter which hole they cover, they pour another. They pour across like a flood. And uh, you would assume that it's uh, an American newspaper talking about Mexican illegal immigration. But in fact, it was a newspaper back then, a Mexican newspaper, lamenting the illegal influx of Americans into Mexican territory uh, with no uh, respect for borders or anything like that. So uh, these laws were all an att in attempt, again, to either uh, curtail American immigration or to have Americans go back to their country uh, after all the tension that was arising in Mexico's northern territories in Texas. Uh, the final blow to this cultural collision that would kind of pull us to war was the ascending, the ascending to power of Antonio López de Santana, uh, also known as the Napoleon of the West by many scholars. Now, Santana came to power and uh, for the first of three times, in fact, uh, and decides to try to centralize the government. Uh, this will anger and irritate many people in Mexico. Uh, there was rebellions in California, in Oaxaca, parts of Central America that began to break away, uh, in Nuevo León, and in particular, of course, in Texas where people like uh, Sam Houston and Stephen Austin used this uh, centralism policy to discuss the avenues to break away from the Mexican Republic. And so now we're entering, of course, into the famous uh, story of the Alamo. The Alamo was an abandoned mission that has become, in American culture, uh, a very mythical event that which took place there, uh, giving rise to the folklore and, and uh, heroes like uh, uh, David Crockett, for example, amongst others. Uh, but let's talk about what exactly occurred there. Uh, the Alamo, again, was an abandoned uh, site that, uh, where the Americans had fortified themselves with some Tejano, Mexicano support. The Mexican president arrived with his troops, and even though his own advisors uh, told him not to attack the site, Santana decides to do so. And uh, once uh, the site is taken, uh, he orders all uh, women and children to be released by the execution of all uh, males, even those that had surrendered. Uh, because he perceived them, of course, as people who had committed treason against the Mexican Republic. Now, this is where the, where the uh, importance is, I think, on the Alamo, in that it, in the United States, it was uh, in the newspapers, um, in, in the public stages and spaces, it was seen as an attack on the American uh, frontier, an attack on Americans. And if you want to give, uh, it became uh, larger than life. It became... Uh, uh, it memorized in the saying, remember the Alamo, for example, right? Now, the Alamo campaign, uh, the Alamo battle, was not a major success uh, for the Mexican military or a humongous loss for the American colonists in Texas. In fact, more of an impact, historically speaking, was the Battle of San Jacinto that took place weeks later. In that particular battle, uh, the Mexican forces were caught by surprise by the colonists and uh, of all things, they captured the, Me the Mexican president, Antonio Lopez de Santana. And he, Santana, under capture now, was forced to sign the famous Treaty of Velasco. The Treaty of Velasco, which, at least in paper, recognized the independence of the new republic or the new nation of Texas. Uh, this uh, Texas Republic will remain independent for some close to 10 years, uh, between 1836 um, and 1845, uh, when it was annexed by the United States, again, much to the controversy uh, that it would create, triggering the Mexican-American War. The Treaty of Velasco would prove to create more problems than it solved. For one, the Mexican nation did not see it as valid. The Mexican Republic stated that the Congress of Mexico did not ever have any kind of jurisdiction over the treaty, and that the treaty had been signed under duress. While the United States goes on, of course, to accept it and exchange political attaches with the new young nation of Texas. This, again, will lead us closer to the events of war. We'll discuss that in our next section when we discuss the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. We hope you enjoyed this material.